is Danielle Davis, and I am a student at Morton School of Excellence from Chicago. The, the teachers in my life are not just leading my classroom, but they are teaching me to be a leader too. That is why I am excited to introduce this panel on educational excellence, moderated by former DC School Chancellor, Kaya Henderson, so we can learn about how we can help teachers be the best leaders they can be. She's joined by teachers, Frida Perlis from Chicago, Patrick Now from New York, Corey Kane from Chicago, and student Marley Lewis from Minneapolis. Thank you. You did a good job. Good morning. Wait, I thought that I was in a room full of teachers. You know how this goes. If you're bringing low energy to the classroom, right, then we're gonna have a boring conversation. So I'm gonna start all over again, act like that just never happened. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, my name is Kaya Henderson, and I'm really excited to be here today. I'm excited because anytime I'm in a room full of teachers, um, I know I'm in a good place. And it's important at this particular moment in our country's history for an event such as this to happen. We are on the precipice of something, something. And it could be something perilous or it could be something great. And what I'm excited about is that Educators for Excellence has decided to harness the incredible power of teachers to try to make this moment in American history great. For far too long, other people tell us what should be happening in our classrooms and in our schools. People who haven't walked the walk, people who haven't talked the talk. And the declaration is incredibly important at this moment when lots of people are trying to figure out what to do with American schools. The most important voice to listen to is teachers. And so I'm excited today to host a panel of amazing teachers and of course, the person that represents the reason that we do everything that we do, an awesome student, um, to talk a little bit about educational excellence and equity. So, are you all ready? Yes. Sure. All right, well, let's do this. Um, first, I want to start with Marley, uh, who is our amazing student from Minneapolis. Y'all give it up for Marley. <laughs> Marley, have you ever been on the Oprah show before? <laughs> Okay, it's your debut. I'm channeling Oprah. You ready? Yeah. Okay, so tell us about a teacher who has shaped your life and how they did that. Well, I have a lot of teachers that I have good relationships with, but there's one in particular, and that's my chemistry um, 10th grade teacher from last year, Miss Horn. Um, in the beginning of the year, I was like, Cool, I'm making it to school on time, but then I started to slack a little bit, and that's a class that you need to graduate. Mm -hmm. So it became to the point of where I was missing that class a lot. So I was failing for a while. Every other class I was okay with, but she, so to help me stay on track, she took her personal time. She stayed after school with me. She took other classes when she was supposed to be helping other students. She took the time to help me during advisory and lunch to make sure I was on track to graduate. And that really showed me that teachers do care about you. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up to all of our teachers and start with this question. We know that excellent teaching can have a lasting impact on students from reducing the likelihood that a student will become pregnant as a teenager to increasing the likelihood that they attend college and earn a higher income. But as any teacher can tell you, the learning curve for teaching is steep, right? Uh, most teachers will tell you that they did not feel prepared on the first day of school, yes. <laughs> um, and most say it took a few years in the classroom before they really felt confident in their schools, in, in their classrooms. Can you each share a little bit about your own experience in the first years of teaching and how we can better support new teachers to be prepared for the challenges of the classroom? Sure. Um, in my first few years of pe teaching, although I'd had some classroom experience prior to graduating, I felt very ill-equipped to deal with a very specific population of students, which was students with special needs. So although I'd had a lot of general training, I felt as though I really didn't know how to reach all of my students. Um, and as a 2015 um, Hope Street Group National Teacher Fellow, I, I've surveyed um, teachers across the country 
and heard over and over again, teachers didn't feel prepared. Teachers needed more time um, to understand how to work with students with special needs, um, English language learners, and really students as a whole in terms of just learning how to differentiate instruction so that they were really able to make their classroom accessible to all students. Um, and then that seems to be true of teachers who graduated 20 years ago and teachers who graduate now, is yeah. that really higher education is still and not meeting the needs of teachers um, and, and really doing the work of helping teachers to be prepared for today's classroom. Sure. Patrick? Um, so my first year teaching, I was definitely in the same boat. I felt very unprepared. Um, I didn't feel like I, I was qualified really to be teaching at that time. And I feel like my graduate program was very practical in certain respects. It was a lot about methodology. It was a lot about like the ideal universe and where you would teach instead of the reality of where you actually have to teach. And I don't think it prepared us for challenging environments, whether it's uh, high poverty environments, whether it's kids with disabilities, whether it was kids with uh, their English language learners. Um, and I feel like I didn't spend enough time actually student teaching or in front of kids before I actually got to teach. There was a short period of maybe two, two and a half months of like student teaching, but I didn't actually teach for most of that time. I was kind of hanging out, observing, and didn't get enough time to kind of practice things and kind of prepare for the future of me being in a classroom on my own. And I didn't feel like there was a lot of support for things like behavior management, where it was like, well, what do I do when things don't work? I can plan the great lesson, but then like something happened. There's a fire drill. There's a disruption. Or the kids just don't get it. And like, where do I, how do I redirect myself to like be successful and learn from those mistakes? And I think one of the things that needs to be shifted, and I'm starting to see more of it now from when I first started teaching, was a shift towards people being more comfortable asking for help. And it not being perceived as in, if I don't know what I'm doing, then I must be a bad teacher, as opposed to like, I don't know what, I, don't, I need help. Like asking an administrator to come in and support me, or asking another colleague, and having an openness where people feel comfortable to say, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do in this situation. Can I get some feedback or support for that? And it not be perceived as me being a, a lesser of a teacher because I don't have to do this already. Sure. Awesome. Corey, you didn't come straight to the classroom. No, I so didn't. So tell us what happened. So I, I hear these stories a lot from uh, that we heard from my colleagues here. And I started in the corporate world. And then I walked by an office one day and saw a sign that said, you want to be a teacher? It's like, <laughs> mm, mm, I heard some stories, maybe not. But I did it, right? <laughs> so um, I actually uh, I went to a program in, uh, Cam in Boston, Massachusetts. And they just threw us into the classroom. I had no training as a teacher or anything. But it was very powerful. Right? Because what I'm hearing is, and what I kind of think we should change is, is that we teach teachers the pedagogy a lot, right? But when it's time to get in the classroom, we're like, well, what did page five say? What did page 12 say? You know, what, what I'm seeing is not on page five. What I'm seeing is not on page 12. And to me, I equate it to riding a bicycle. We didn't sit down and read a book about, well, the wheels turn. And then you grab the handles and we got on the bicycle, we fell, right? Someone who was good at it saw me and said, hey, no, you want to do this, you want to do that. And that's the support he's speaking of, right? Yeah. So I think that we need to kind of flip it. And I've had an opportunity as a principal to attend Teachers College in Columbia, where I was a pilot, a part of a pilot program where I was taught by principals. Mm -hmm. So no longer is it a professor who's doing the research saying, yeah. here's what I think works. Here's a principal saying, Let's, let me take you to my school and show you what it looks like. Right? So we'll read a book and we'll, read, we'll do this, but then we'll go apply it. Right? And it was really awesome to do it that way. Um, as a student, I got to actually sit down with principals who are in the field mm -hmm. and say, hey, try this. I saw it on page five. <laughs> right, and then you know, if it if it if it works, you know, I took that knowledge back to my school now in Chicago, and it seems to be working now. I think, you know, I I didn't walk into my first day saying, you know, I haven't seen this before. Sure, I walked in a little bit more empowered, a little bit more, you know, successful. So I think that uh, we need to kind of revamp our our teaching of teachers. Yeah. So it's not just from a book, but it's also from the field as well. Yeah, I think really concrete insights around teacher preparation, which for years mm -hmm. just refuses to change, and I think. We've got to begin to put some different pressure levers on higher ed institutions and on our alternative yes. programs to make sure that people are being taught by practitioners, to make sure that we focus on differentiation and give people the ability to you know, handle lots of different populations or provide effective strategies for lots of different populations. And we have to create an environment where people can ask for help. Yes. We have to. Um, Frida. I learned that you worked with the Chicago Teachers Union Quest Center to create Common Core Align materials and lessons. What do you think needs to be done to support teachers to fully transition 
or more effectively transition, because we have transitioned, right? Mm -hmm. It's bumpy, it's been ugly, mm -hmm. but we have transitioned. So how do we help teachers more effectively transition to higher standards and increase rigor in the classroom? So I think the support is really dependent on where a teacher is in her career, his or her career, because in talking with teachers, um, during my fellowship, I learned that t a lot of new teachers felt like, oh, I understand the standards, but I don't know how to apply them because sure. they they were lacking that classroom experience. And then there are the teachers who, you know, entered the field 20 years ago um, and really have spent the last 20 years creating these amazing units that are suddenly not aligned mm -hmm. to the Common Core standards. And so there's been a little bit of a struggle about, well, you know, how do I adapt my practice? How do I adapt my teaching so that I can incorporate that rigor and incorporate the standards without giving up everything that I already know that is effective and works? Um, so in terms of support, I feel like we really need to lean on each other in terms of just understanding that teachers are the experts, just regardless of what the standards are, teachers are the experts, and, and learning to leverage our expertise um, I think sometimes we can feel there's a little bit of learned helplessness in terms of expecting a curriculum company to give you something that will help you teach to these new standards. But really, I have found in my work um, at the union is that all the units I've created my, on my own in working with other teachers have been the most powerful units and the most closely aligned to the standards and have provided the most rigor for my students. So I, I do believe that support really has to be differentiated, much like for students, um, and that rather than us looking outside of our profession for help, we need to look internally at one yeah. another. I mean, it's a little bit about trust, right? Mm -hmm. Trusting that teachers know what they're doing, that they are the experts, and that they can perform instead of trying to teacher-proof curriculum, right? Mm -hmm. Patrick, um, let's talk a little bit about teacher evaluations, which everybody loves, right? Um, you know that over the last few years, there has been a lot of action in the eval realm. And many districts and uh, other types of schools have moved from traditional kind of checklist evaluations to multi-measured evaluations that include some form of student achievement. Um, what is an important change that you'd like to see in how evaluations are conducted to ensure that we're getting a more accurate picture of teacher skills? That's a good question. Um, I think one thing that people sometimes are shifting away from the whole testing process, and I think testing is still important. I think you still need to evaluate what the kids are doing and what teachers are doing so you have an understanding of where the kids need to get to and what supports they still need. Um, but I don't think it should be the end-all, be-all for what you're evaluating your teachers on because in the end, I have a product that comes to me and I have to work with the product that comes to me. And if a student is two and a half years below grade level and if I make up a year of that, then that's progress. And if you're looking at the, the growth of the student as opposed to like, the end product, he's still below grade level, well then it's a little more demoralizing for teachers. But I think there are other ways you can evaluate teachers as well. I think one is looking at either things like project-based learning, there's a big push towards like parent engagement, which we all know is very helpful for the kids and very uh, helpful for them in their successes. Um, so there could be things like, uh, New York is floating some ideas, like for example, if I'm a, I'm a science teacher, I could be doing a science fair and that could be part of my evaluation. Mm -hmm. What, what did the kids do? What did they learn? How many parents did I get to come to the, to the fair? Like, what are the things that I do that are all still very relevant things that aren't just a test score? And I think the final thing looks at observations. And I think that, you know, everyone, every, every principal has the idea of how they're going to run observations for the year. And it sometimes just doesn't work out that way because something else happens. A parent comes in for a meeting, they don't get to an observation. They have to go to a budget meeting. And I think that those observations need to be done throughout the year instead of being stacked at certain points. So it's like now it's May and you still need two observations and you get just two in May. Yeah. How helpful is that for your practice? If it's not done, they should be done throughout the year. So maybe there should be some sort of structure of like there has to be an evaluation or an observation every six weeks or every two months. Mm -hmm. I think you should also increase number of observations so that it's not this, this stigma of like that she's coming to evaluate me and it's only four times in a year and that's what my whole rating is going to be for that section. So like you have more observations, and each one of those is, I don't say watered down, but it's like if you have only four of them, each one counts 25%. If you do 10 of them, each one counts 10%. So there's an opportunity. There's more opportunity for principals and administrators to see what's actually going on in your classroom and provide more feedback and support for you. Um, and I think the observations, going back to what we were talking about earlier, it's, they're there to help teachers get better. It's not about trying to get teachers you know, caught for doing the wrong thing. It's more about like what can we do to help you improve? And I think the more observations administrators do, the more opportunities they have to give feedback, but it also makes teachers a little more comfortable and students a little more comfortable about teachers' uh, administration coming in and not feeling like this, I'm under the microscope for this one period. 
I think we should do a video with Patrick talking about <laughs> what good evaluation should look like because that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. <clears throat> Corey, you've been on both sides of the evaluation thing, right? As a teacher being evaluated and then um, now as an assistant principal. Um, how would you like to see teacher evaluation evolve? What he said. But, um, I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to add on to kind of what he said, um, I am lucky to work at a school where I get to kind of pilot some new things and try new things. So um, I really want to see more of the score that a teacher gives. It's not like a end all be all, like he said, but kind of uh, I want the teacher to see it as a support system. So if you get a low rating, right, that doesn't mean, you know, that's you're it. a bad that's teacher. It. Right, right. I like you to need some help in a particular area. Exactly. And to me, I like to create one goal, right? Because so often, Teachers get this evaluation that has like, oh, you did 40 things wrong. Well, how do I fix 40 things, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this, there's, how about let's fix one thing, right? And once you reach that finish line, create a new finish line, mm -hmm. and a new finish line. My goal is to create master teachers. It's not to catch them. It's not to, to you know, see what's wrong, right? It's to find what's right. Use that, empower them, and kind of build upon that to make it better. I also think that the two evaluations that teachers, especially in Chicago, are given a year is ridiculous, right? And who am, why is it that I'm the only one that gets to say if you're good or not? Yeah. I want teachers involved. I want students involved. I want parents involved. I even want the janitor involved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> why? Because classroom environment is, you know, is, yeah. is the room clean. Like, I want everyone involved in this, in this process so that at the end we have this, this big puzzle right, that is a teacher, mm -hmm. right? But there's, there are different pieces that, say, that the teacher can look at and say, oh, I've got to improve that, mm -hmm. right? And then where's the support coming from? It's coming from teachers. It's coming from the janitor who's an expert, right, in making sure the classroom is clean, right? So we want to build this team of evaluators, not just this one person who says, you're good or bad. That's, you know, I'm not the king of the, the school, right? We're all stakeholders in this, in this, in this uh, kind of a program to make yeah. it best for our students. Nice. Frida, you've been working with other teachers on issues of evaluation um, and connecting it to professional development. Tell us a little bit about some of the ideas that you and your colleagues have come up with. So what teachers um, believe is that the most effective evaluation is tied directly to the type of professional development that a teacher will receive. Um, so often, RPD is outsourced. So we have outside vendors coming in to teach us about whatever it is, rather than tapping into the expertise that's already in the building. And so if there's a teacher that um, is struggling with one particular aspect in her evaluation, his or her evaluation, then that teacher should be paired with someone in the building who's exemplary in that area. And so teachers are talking about how can we closely tie the teacher evaluation to professional development? How can we create a roadmap so teachers understand where to improve and so that teachers don't focus on the deficits? Because, I mean, there are, there's, there's always room for improvement. Um, as a veteran teacher, I have two evaluations a year, um, and they provide, as, as much as I know I'm a great teacher, there's always room for me to grow, and I really receive no feedback from my principal because there's no, there's no roadmap for me in terms of what can I do next. I mean, I sort of have to self, I have to figure those things out for myself and just pave my own path forward. Um, and so I feel like, particularly for new teachers who have a lot of room to grow, there needs to be a close tie between PD and our, our teacher evaluation system. Yeah, I mean, I think everything that you all have said is right. And as a person who used to run a district, I think one of the traps that we get into is we create an evaluation system, we do our best thinking at the onset, and then we don't talk to our teachers about how that evaluation system is working. And so at DC Public Schools, when we introduced our first version of our, our teacher evaluation system, we called it Impact 1.0 to signal to people that we would make changes. And we met with teachers, and teachers said, we want lots of observations. We want five, and we want them spread out over the year. And they said, we don't just want our principal or our assistant principal. We want somebody who's a content expert. And our teachers said, you know, all manner of things that these folks have said. And we tweaked, and we tweaked until we got to the right answer for our schools. And I think that sometimes as districts and as CMOs, we feel like, well, we made it and it's done and you can't make changes. But I think it only becomes dynamic and effective when you listen to teachers and use teacher feedback to actually improve the tool. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Marley, 
So America is changing rapidly, right? Yes. Um, since 2014, students of color have constituted the majority of America's K-12 student population, but the national teaching force remains predominantly white. In mm -hmm. fact, four out of five teachers are white. Do you think it's important for students to have teachers in their schools that look like them? Yes, I do, because the world is diverse. So when you're put into an area where you don't see diversity, it kind of like gets a mentality in your head that, oh, this not diverse. So then when you get into the world and you see all the diversity, you're not going to know how to react or be in that type of environment. You're going to think, why is it like that? You're going to have to relearn how to act around certain type of people. There should be lots of different types of races of teachers because people come from all types of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So like if you have a diverse set of teachers, then you will feel like you're more comfortable because then you'll see all types of backgrounds. And then when then there's certain races of teachers, like they may not come from the same background you do. So then when you have the same background, the same race teacher as you, then they'll understand certain things you go through and challenges and be able to help you more and connect with you more. And then you can connect with everybody and see everyone's diversity and backgrounds and cultures and all types of things like that. Amen. Thank you, Marley. We're going to, after this panel, we're going to send them down the street to uh, whatever it is, Maryland Avenue, is that where it is? Maryland Avenue to the U.S. Department of Education and let them tell the people what we want. Um, Corey, for years in education, we've been talking about the need for more teachers of color and more male teachers. Teacher of color, male teacher. Um, what are the concrete actions that we can take to diversify the teaching force in years to come? Oh, easy. Just uh, put more teachers of color in there. Teachers of <laughs> put, put them. Yeah. Just pick them up. Put them. <laughs> well, we have to be a little bit more intentional about it. Uh, we can't just talk about it. We have to do it. Right. So um, I was, I thought, I think I was kind of sought out either by the universe or by you know, um, someone or someone who said, you know, you could be a great teacher, right? So I was influenced by someone. I did not see many teachers uh, when I was in school who looked like me, right? But um, I know in my school, we intentionally seek teachers of color, right? I'm at a school of all black boys. So I want them to see you know, people who look like them, all right? Um, last night, I had an opportunity to meet with five of my students at Georgetown University. Woohoo, hoya um, yeah, Saxon. Yeah, hoya, right, my dad's favorite school. Um, and I sat with them, and they, I remember teaching them freshman year, and they were all like, I want to be a basketball player. I want to do, you know, those are the things they saw. I want to be a rapper, right? And they kind of still want to be rappers. But um, <laughs> I sat with them last night, and we're eating, and then I'm like, you know, so what's your GPA? What's this? And I'm like, you're always asking those questions, man. Just get, what's the point? Or what do you want to do with your life? And I was shocked, you know. Uh, I, I, they all said, I want to get a master's in education. It's like, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> Why? Right? And it really ended with, they, they said to me, I want to be as cool as you are. And I'm thinking, do you know what I do every day? <laughs> I am not, like, cool. You know, I'm not cool. What do, you, what do you mean? Right? But really, it was, in front of them, they saw someone who was passionate. Um, I quit my job to do this. Right? I didn't uh, have to be there. I wanted to be there. Um, and they felt loved. They felt that in a world where they're seen as invaluable, um, well, in the world, they're seen as having no value. Let's put it mm -hmm. like that, right? Um, and uh, they walk to a classroom every day with someone who spent all night preparing this great lesson, and you're going to love it, I promise you, <laughs> right? And to, for them to actually see the passion behind it, they didn't want to learn genetics, right? They didn't want to, you know, talk about Avogadro's number, right? <laughs> but when I spoke about it, it sounded like, you know, Jay-Z cool. Jay talking, right? <laughs> it sounded like Jay-Z, right? So to me, it begins, like, just like... You know, kind of, you know, a few years ago, maybe like eight years ago, we had a grassroots movement to make something happen. Mm -hmm. I think it starts in the classroom, right? Put more teachers of color in the classroom, right? So I'm a principal now. That's my goal. I want to put more teachers of color in the classroom. When I went to school. Uh, I met a uh, people from 111 countries, right? I learned different languages. I fell in love with languages because of it. I fell in love with food, culture. I I'm traveling more. And when I meet someone who's not like me, I'm more open to say, you know, hey, What's up? How's mm -hmm. it going? And I have no bias in, in, in anymore. I, um, I used to, 
I had never seen people who did these things that I'm doing now, right? Or seen people who didn't look like me doing the thing that I'm doing now. So I think it's important to uh, put those type of teachers in front of students. Nice. Patrick, how do we make teaching te appeal to more students broadly? Um, I think it starts at just creating a, an inclusive environment where everyone feels welcome, feels comfortable, where the kids are not afraid to make mistakes, they're not afraid to ask questions or say they don't know how to do something. Because um, in the end, like, no one's going to want to be a teacher if they hated going to school. <laughs> say that. They didn't have good say it one more time, Patrick. No one's going to want to be a teacher if they hated going to school. Even if they do well in school, if they didn't like being in school, or they didn't have a good relationship with their teachers, with their administrators, they're not going to want to become a teacher later. And I think it also helps to have give kids opportunities to try to do a little bit of teaching and do, do some leadership opportunities, whether it's kids an expert on multiplication, you want to let him run a class or run a lesson or run a small group or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or having opportunities, whether it's cultural opportunities as well, but trying to make it a, a, a place where everyone feels welcome to be who they are and not feel that they're different in any way. And I think it also goes back to what you're talking about and what uh, Marlon's talking as well, and having teachers that, are, that look like you and that can relate to you so that there, there's um, less misunderstandings about cultural differences and having the kids feel, again, welcome that they're, they are who they are and that I'm proud of who I am and that you're giving them opportunities to become, you know, to kind of practice and do little samples of being teaching. But I think it's still come down in the end, like they have to enjoy being in school because they're going to create that positive attitude. You know, I was, I had a lot of positive experience from my own kid, uh, teachers when I was a kid. My father was a teacher and like it definitely, resonated with me, and I think it's part of the reason why I became a teacher was the idea that like, I thought very highly of education. I thought it was an outlet to do something positive, um, and that there was a chance to do something and make a difference and like, really have an influence on like, another generation of kids. And I'm not going to lie too, like, salary is definitely uh, something that I'm sure if you were, and it's not, a, not the end all be all. It's not like people are like, I don't want to not Stop be apologizing. <laughs> salary it's is an no, issue. I mean, no, it's, it, it, is, it is. is an issue. And I think part of that is that you can use salary as an opportunity to attract people that That's might right. be a chemist or a biologist that maybe come be a chemistry teacher in high school. Or, or maybe you're a lawyer and you want to be do an economics class or something like that, but like, or, or a civics class. But like having opportunities and enticing people to maybe to, to consider doing that without taking maybe the massive pay cut. But again, I don't think that's, the, the, that's not the reason why people don't want to be teachers. Like, I went into teaching knowing that like, I'm not going to be making you know, the money of a, of a lawyer. And that was OK. That's like, not like the end all be all of things of like, I, everyone would just do it if it just made more money. Like, that's not going to be the, the answer to things. But it helps, right? Yes, it much. helps. And I, I want us to stop apologizing for demanding the salary that we deserve. We enable every other profession. We work harder than most people do. And we deserve to be paid a decent wage. One of the proudest things that I think we accomplished at DC Public Schools was raising our teacher salary. So we now have the highest first year teacher salary in the country at $51,000, which, right, ooh, but it's still not enough. It's still not enough, right? Teachers deserve to be paid. One thing I wanna say to my teacher friends in the audience, um, that both of these young men said, how we communicate about our profession enables people to come in or not. And when we are sad sacks and sorry sues about our job, when we complain about how hard teaching is and all that stuff, it makes people think, oh, I don't want to do that. But every single day, we get amazing joy from mm -hmm. our classrooms. We build relationships with awesome students like Marley. And nobody wants to be in a relationship with somebody who's sad. <laughs> nobody wants to be in a relationship with somebody who's not making a relationship fun. And so I, I think we have an obligation, besides changing salaries and doing all these other things, we have an obligation to convey the amazing joy that teaching brings so that other people are attracted to the profession. All right, I'm getting a we got to go sign. I got two more questions. So Frida, uh, blah, 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 yeah. How do we get more teachers engaged in um, shaping education policy the way you have through your testimony before the Illinois State Legislature, the National Center on Teacher Quality Advisory Group, and the 700 other million things that you do outside of the classroom? So I wasn't born a teacher advocate, and I was <laughs> definitely, um, it, it definitely took a unique opportunity. Um, what I feel that teachers don't recognize in themselves is that they can all be advocates. We are advocates for our students, right? And we know we do that every day. But in terms of advocating for the profession, I think we don't always recognize in ourselves that we have the potential to use our voice to impact policy at multiple levels. And so it's really creating structures that help teachers understand what are those entry points. Um, 
You can do that at the school level. You can talk to your principal. You can go to the district. You can go here. You can go there. Um, prior to my work in, you know, teacher in, in working in education policy, I had to do research. I had to figure out what was out there, and there really wasn't very much. Um, particularly in Chicago, there's really there are not a lot of places where teachers can go and they have someone on their side telling them, yes, what you say is important. Um, so I think I think again, it's about creating structures and helping teachers understand what their level of comfort is in terms of engaging in those types of conversations, preparing teachers for the types of conversations. We tend to talk with emotion and feeling, but understanding that in order to enter a conversation with a legislator, you need to have data, you need to have facts, you need to understand your profession in a different way. And so um, I think that there's a lot that can be um, done with teacher voice if teachers understand that they are one, a valuable part of the conversation and that they know how to access or at least, you know, access the right people in order to have those conversations. Yep, and we're thankful for E4E for helping to create those channels. Last question, Marley, if you could speak on behalf of all of the students in America and say absolutely <laughs> one thing to teachers, what would you say? Um, for teachers, right? Yes. I would say just be who you are and try your best and make it. Interesting. All right. <laughs> Be who you are, try your best, make it in the show. You all give it up for the panel. Um, I want to thank each of the teachers and Marley for their energy and their insight this morning. And uh, we are going to ask that you take a few minutes, 10 to be exact, at your tables to reflect a little bit about some of the conversations that we were having today. Again, join me in thanking our panelists. All right.